shortly, but um, I didn't want our time together to expire and us not achieve some, some goals. Um, so there'll be some, some pretty pictures hopefully for us to look at. Um, the honest truth is that this was a, a, this was a presentation of shock and awe. This was a lot of style and not a whole lot of substance. Um, we can certainly go into more substance than any particular topic that you guys care about. But I, my, my goal for this kind of, the, as you saw the, the, the title of the talk is Head to Tail. It really is a kind of whirlwind tour, a survey of all the things that we do and see. And so obviously in 45 minutes it's very hard to delve into each and every one of them. It was more to give you kind of a, an introduction to our pediatric neurosurgical world. Um, I do have some some very fundamental goals that I'd like to achieve, though, um, as we leave the, the symposium. Um, I, I'd love for you to leave my session with just some, some key points. I mean, if you forget everything else about all the, the glitz and the glam of the pictures that I show, um, I'd love for you to be equipped with some very important um, learning, learning points and, and, and skills. And, and it's because you are on the front lines often. Um, you are often screening patients first and catching things uh, and, and, and starting this chain reaction of, of a workup. And so I want you to have an eye out, a, a neurosurgical eye out for things that may be worrisome or things that have you worried um, or a family member worried and really probably don't have to be. Um, so I was hoping to achieve that with some of these pictures today and, I, and I'm looking forward to getting these pictures up. But uh, maybe what we'll do is uh, I'll, at a minimum, go through those those key key core lessons with you so you'll have those and then you can just sit back and watch a bunch of pictures. Mm -hmm. um, so head to tail. So just kind of going roughly in no particular order, but from head to tail, um, head. So the thing I care most about, especially for my frontline folks, um, is recognizing danger and, and recognizing a child in trouble. And so from a head standpoint, um, whether it's hydrocephalus or tumor or bleed or seizure or whatever, um, th the things that will get a, a kid in, in, a, in a significant amount of trouble uh, is steadily uh, but rapidly um, increasing uh, intracranial pressure. So how do you recognize intracranial pressure rises? And it, it's, it's relatively straightforward. Um, doesn't matter how old you are. If you're getting very sleepy, if you're having a wicked headache, and you're throwing up, it probably means that your brain is not happy. Um, slowly, slowly, slowly the pressure is building and you get uncomfortable and um, that's where the headache comes from uh, and then you get more uncomfortable and that's where the nausea and the vomiting comes from and then the circuit starts shutting down because the, the blood is having a harder and harder and time pushing through this pressure head and then you get sleepy um, and so if you, if you leave, well honestly if you just, if that's the only thing you remember from my talk I would love for that to be the case because a lot of different things can present with, with that very simple presentation of it raised intracranial pressure of headache, sleepiness, and vomiting. Um, so uh, in a baby that's been a little bit on the sleepy side, that's been throwing up a lot more, um, and uh, you know, has been cranky and fussy and crying, alarm bells should go off. Um, they're not going to be able to tell you, you know, mommy, I have a headache, or daddy, um, I, I, I don't feel so well. Um, but they're not going to be quite right. Um, all right. So, so it looks like what has happened is um, in a very older version of this talk um, donated by my partner, his son, um, is on a stick and not my version. So we'll eventually go through those pictures together. Um, and so uh, let, let me just run through my key points first and then we'll, we'll show some examples. Um, so uh, the last thing with the baby with an open fontanelle, an open, open soft spot like we don't have, is that that's nature's pressure release valve. So in addition to those three things, if you've got a baby with those three things and you uh, massage their hair and their soft spot isn't flat or sunken, it's actually bulging, um, that's uh, another warning sign. Um, so you, you don't want to uh, miss that. Um, okay, so next thing that comes across uh, very commonly uh, referrals to my outpatient clinic um, is increasing head size. Uh, oh my God, I'm a pediatrician in the community, and I've been tra tracking this kid's head circumference, and little by little, it's been getting bigger. Well, um, that can be a sign that things are expanding because the skull hasn't fused yet, and it's a little clamshell, and it opens up wider and wider. And so you track the head circumference curves, and the curve is much steeper than the peers. But realize at the very beginning of those head circumference curves, it's all steep. All those curves are steep, and then they start to level off. Unfortunately, those curves are generated 
uh, from all comers, kids of any ethnicity and every culture, and, uh, and as you can as you can probably see, um, we are all different, and so are our head circumferences as we grow. And um, just because you have a steep part in your curve doesn't necessarily mean anything, um, especially in the absence of uh, those other three things that I warned you guys about, the headache, the vomiting, the sleepiness. If those things are absent and the headache is um, steadily increasing, but the kids otherwise well, that's typically something else called benign extraaxial fluid of infancy, meaning they get a scan and there's some extra fluid that's on the outside, and I'll show a picture of that. But that's not hydrocephalus, that's just the skull's growing fast in the brain, so there's a little gap. Um, and there's no raised intracranial pressure with that. Um, there's also this thing called just congenital macrocephaly. My family's got big heads. You know, I have a big head, and Uncle Joe, Joe has a big head, um, and we all have big heads, and that's common too. Um, a lot of pediatricians will follow up with scans. We'll, we'll help you interpret those things, but I just want to point out the fact that not every rapidly increasing head circumference automatically means hydrocephalus. Um, so just, I want you to be aware of that. Um, screening of the head. We're shifting away from CAT scan, CAT scan, CAT scan. Why? Radiation. Every single one of those CAT scans has radiation. And we at Children's Oakland, um, and increasingly so at Mission Bay, have the beauty of these things called quick scans, or rapid MRIs, which are non-CTs, MRIs, non-sedated, uh, so the kid's still awake, zip and you zip out, and you get the information you need. Um, so I want to establish that trend in your mind, too. If my, if my kid needs a, a scan, whether it's your kid or your, your niece or your nephew, um, and you're at a place where they only do t CT scans, you should ask about, well, hold on now, before you do that, to radiate my kid, um, is there a way we can do this thing called a quick scanner or a rapid MRI? And if not, if the kid's otherwise well, uh, maybe we could go someplace like this. Um, save that kid uh, some radiation. Um, dimples and pits, so we're supposed to start to move down. So you can have dimples in different places. Dimples and pits at the bridge of the nose, those are kind of funny. Um, those are a little weird. And um, the, the central nervous system starts out as a sheet, and then folds into a tube, and then it zips up and it zips down like a cannoli. Okay, so think about a cannoli with the cream coming out of the ends. Um, usually the, the top end of the cannoli seals. That's why we're typically not seeing, or we don't have kids who are born with unzipped tops of the cannolis. Um, I will show you some pictures of some unzipped cannolis up top. A lot of those kids don't make it through the pregnancy. Um, in utero, they expire, and so we don't even know about those kids. Why? Because the central nervous system kind of does its thing at the earliest stages of pregnancy, long before some women even know that they're pregnant. Um, so the, the top zip um, problems tend not to show themselves, but sometimes they do. The much more common cannoli problems are the lower end of the cannoli, so these uh, the neural tube defects such as um, spina bifida or mild meningitis, where the end of the spinal canal is actually wide open and it's fused with the skin. I'm going to show you some pictures. Or it could be really subtle, like a little dimple or a little hairy patch or a little hemangioma, a little tuft of um, blood vessels. And that's the, the only signal that something underneath is not right. Um, so dimples can be warning signs of something going on. Um, I mentioned if there's a dimple here, it can mean there's a tract leading into this, the skull. Um, and there can be something trapped inside. If there's a dimple here, same thing, there can be a trap leading out of the spinal uh, canal. Um, but dimples that are buried in the actual gluteal crease or the baby butt crack, um, deep, deep, deep inside, those may have a little fiber going down to the tip of the tailbone. Who cares about those? In fact, we stop even scanning those. Don't, those that are in the crease don't amount to anything with all the imaging that we do. The ones that end above the crease, um, those do. Um, Okay, um, all right, well, since we have some pictures, let's go through some stuff here. Okay, um, okay. so um, there's a lot of bragging about what we, who we are and what we do. Um, I'll insist, we're going to skip that. Um, uh, sprinkled here and there are going to be some interesting photos, so now it's, now it's kind of more of the shock and awe. I've got about 30 minutes left. I want to make sure that you leave here going, oh. Um, sometimes there are congenital abnormalities that we are born with. Um, in this case, this is a condition called cutis aplasia, where the, the, the cannoli didn't zip at the very last stage, where the skin didn't cover the, the skull, and that's what cutis aplasia looks like, and below is how it's fixed, it looks fixed. Um, this next segment of slides is um, looking at synastosis, a congenital abnormality of the fusion of the bones. These grooves in the skull are called sutures. Um, they start out open and then they gradually seal. If they seal prematurely, the effect is they sort of pull the skull toward, toward that suture and create abnormal head shapes. I'll remind you though that this is typically just a bone problem. This is not a brain development problem. This doesn't affect intelligence. 
It's, um, it's, if it's one suture or even two sutures, they tend not to cause any problems with brain development. It's only those syndromic kids who have multiple sutures. Those kids often have like webbed hands and very clear facial abnormalities. Um, so just because you have a problem with one of these sutures doesn't mean any problems for the, the stuff beneath. This is typically just a bone problem. So this is the way things should look. Um, and the, the skull should grow away from the sutures, but in synostosis, it, the effect is as if the bone is growing towards the sutures and pulling um, the skull towards it. So I'm going to show you some pictures of some, um, some de deformities. Um, okay. So um, this is a kid with a unilateral coronal synostosis. So the coronal suture runs this way. So this kid's on his left side, his coronal suture is fused. So again, imagine, it's not really happening, but imagine it's pulling towards that suture. Um, and uh, right here is where the coronal suture would be. And so if it pulls up, this forehead gets flattened on the left, um, and the eye, the top of the eye gets pulled up. Meanwhile, the, the right side is, is round and normal. So there's that asymmetry. This is um, how it looks on a CAT scan. It's, it's missing on the left. This is how they look from face on. So it looks as if you know, his, his eye is kind of raised up. Um, it's, uh, uh, there's a problem sometimes where this, this problem with the lambdoid suture in the back, if this suture is involved, it can be mistaken for a very common um, condition called positional plagiocephaly. Baby just likes to sleep on one side of the head so it gets flat. Um, positional plagiocephaly is much, much, much more common than this other condition, lambdoid synostosis. Um, and the two forces that are at work is um, if you have a um, positional plagiocephaly, uh, it, it, it pushes everything forward. So this kid likes to sleep on this side of the head, so it pushes this ear forward and it pushes this forehead forward, versus a lambdoid suture synostosis, it's pulling everything to it. So um, synostosis versus positional plagiocephaly, um, that's a very mm, rudimentary way to explain how it works. Um, this is someone who has a true lambdoid synostosis, or a place that's in the absence of a synostosis. Um, and look how happy that kid is. Um, and this is, this is tailor-made for the kid. It's 23 hours a day, um, and so it is a big commitment. But after a while, they just get used to it, and it's almost like an article of clothing. They're just used to it. They put on my socks, I put on my pants, I put on my helmet. You know, so, um, um, so just I'm going to show, stop at certain points here to show you some illustrative head shape deformities from synostosis. This is scaphocephaly. Scapho means boat. It's shaped like a boat. Um, this, the sagittal suture is fused, so it's pulling everything forward. And where does all the stuff have to go? Front and back. So they, they have this um, scaphocephalic head shape. Um, that's the sagittal suture missing up top. And you can see the coronal and lambdoid still present. This is trigonocephaly, where the metopic suture is fused and the, sh the, the skull is shaped like a triangle. Um, and then this is intra-op photos, and I apologize if you uh, just had breakfast. Um, let's just switch through real quick. Um, and um, we reshape the bones um, in, in a very big procedure, an open procedure. Um, that's, these are sort of coronal synostosis, and this is post-op uh, for coronal synostosis. Coronal synostosis, reshape, reshape, okay, and post-op. Okay. Um, so the incision to get that kind of exposure is across the top. Um, zigzag, we call it a Charlie Brown. I felt really old the other day when I, I told the family, um, this is a Charlie Brown incision because Charlie Brown has the shirt that's like that. And they looked at me like, who? <laughs> it's really hard to make me feel old. Um, but that's, um, that is the Charlie Brown incision. That's, this is how we used to treat it, or typically would treat big synostosis problems, um, sagittal, um, metopic, uh, coronal, um, even lambdoid, you have to kind of get everything widely exposed if you need to do it open. Um, the, the thing is that we're shifting now to something called an endoscopic technique, where if you get these kids young enough, their bones are not as rigid and they're cartilaginous, and you can make these itty bitty little incisions in the front and the back um, on either side of the synostotic suture. And then you can work your instruments through there. Um, this is a view from a camera that you can see in there. Um, it's a little grainy, but the bone is below and the skin is above. And through these little nick incisions, you can make the cuts you need and wiggle these bone pieces out. So these are actually the, the, the synostotic um, fragments taken out of those itty bitty incisions and then laid back on top of the kid's head. So you can see we can achieve a lot through um, really small openings. This is pre-op, this is post-op. Um, and no uh, Charlie Brown big uh, body coronal incision, um, and we're getting better and better results um, by intervening sooner. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so it'd be nice if we can move away from these big, dramatic um, reconstructions. Um, the issue is that sometimes these reconstructions over time, even especially the big ones, they result in these pinchings. Um, the, the bone healing is an imperfect process, and, and little by little by little that's, that tissue contracts. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that with the big open procedures versus the ones that we do endoscopically, minimally invasive. This is, um, you can see the tape um, on his head after we did the, the minimally invasive. Right after post-op, six months, um, this is what, one year, two years, three years. And if I put the arrow up there, there isn't that same kind of pinch that we're seeing. You know, he's still got some growth to do, but in three years with the other kind of procedure, we tend to see that pinching already. Uh, these are the kinds of measurements that we can do in that big machine um, uh, where the red was pre-op and the, the blue was post-op, whereas we went from kind of a triangulated metopic synostosis, typical metopic synostosis shape to a now warm, normal round shape. Um, moving on to some of the other categories of things that we do, um, this is an arachnoid cyst. Um, this is a common referral that we get. Uh, Sally fell off her scooter. Johnny fell out of a tree. You know, whoever was in a car crash got a scan, and then boom, there's a big cyst in there. Oh my God, my child has a brain tumor. Um, actually, you have this congenital condition called an arachnoid cyst. Your brain is suspended in midair by this spider webby tissue called arachnoid tissue. For whatever reason, in utero, um, these webs can sometimes band together and form little compartments and, and cysts. And the fluid inside those cysts is the same fluid that's bathing your brain all in and around it. Um, and so this is a, this is the, that's the classic way that we find these. Completely incidentally, you were scanned for some other reason, and there it was. In fact, if I scanned all of you guys, I would, I would imagine a good 20% of you have some kind of way, shape, or form, some kind of little cyst collection, um, but it's nothing to worry about. But it's important that we look at these and kind of walk families through that. Um, Sometimes they slowly remodel a bone. They've been in there so long that gentle, steady pressure from the outside in, because the brain is pulsating and so is the cyst, can reshape the bone around it. That white is actually calcified, firm bone, and yet you can see how it's kind of scalloped out. Sometimes it's, it keeps scalloping and scalloping so much um, so that as you look at a baby um, who's got some growth um, um, externally, they have this funny bump on the outside. If we were to take this to the OR and fenestrate it for whatever reason, um, this is what it would look like. We're actually in the interior of the cyst, and that white film is the internal wall that we've gone through to communicate it. We don't typically have to operate on those. It's only if we have a, a situation where someone bangs their head hard enough, rips the cyst, and the cyst kind of herniates out or, or bleeds out. But the vast majority of arachnoid cysts are completely coincidentally found on a CAT scan um, or an MRI for screening purposes of other things. Um, and the vast majority, just they just sit and they behave themselves and we just get scans over time and they don't change. Um, so um, not to be alarmed if you see an arachnoid cyst. Um, okay, I mentioned these little dimple things that you can sometimes have. Um, this is a kid who, um, uh, can, who has some herniation um, through an opening in the skull. This is a CAT scan. Um, the, the picture are a little bit out of order, but sometimes when we have kids who show up with these little tiny tufts of hair or little dimples on the forehead, we get a scan and lo and behold, there's a hole or an opening in the skull. Um, what we're looking for is, is there some kind of congenital defect that wants to herniate through? This is an extreme version of it. This is a nasal encephalocele. Um, encephalocele can happen anywhere along the midline because the cannoli seals in the middle. Um, so you can have these dimples anywhere. Typical places, though, tend to be here, most likely here, sometimes down the back of the head or the neck. Um, and this is post-repair. Um, but this is how subtle they can present. Um, I hope you can see it. This little guy here. What's actually more common is that you have this dimple with just maybe just a little hair coming out of it. Or, or uh, maybe, maybe not a very big hair, but it's dark and it's thick. Um, I had a patient who, had, who presented actually with a, a, a subdural empyema, an infection deep in the brain. She's a teenager. And um, we went through this whole process. And as I took her to the OR to do the craniotomy, I, I was finally up close and personal with her nose. And I saw this. And after I took care of the craniotomy, I went back to mom. I said, you know, she had this thing here. I think, I think she actually has a nasal sinus tract that got infected. And then that's how this all happened. Oh, yeah, that thing, we call that her angel kiss. You know, she's known about that forever, you know, we never... So, um, sometimes you, you families just see these things and it's just, ah, oh, that's just her. Um, so, something for you to keep on your, on your radar. Um, 
This is, is uh, what the end result can be of these tracks, is that some skin elements get stuck deep inside. So um, it's really hard to see the track, which is right here. So the dimples are right here. And then this bubble is the kind of skin cells, glands, sometimes hair follicles stuck deep inside, and those can get infected. Uh, dermoids, lumps and bumps. Um, my baby, I was washing my baby's head, and I felt this bump, and oh my god, um, she has a tumor. Um, more common than not, um, especially along the lines that I showed you where the sutures are, is that, again, in utero, as the layers were forming, some of those outer skin layers got trapped in the deep layers. And um, they, they seal off, and inside these compartments are skin cells, or, um, glands, secreting oils, and hair follicles, and that's what a dermoid cyst is. They tend to be firm immobile, sitting in a little bowl of the bone. Um, so uh, if, they are, if there is a bump and it tends to be on those lines that I showed you on that cartoon before, it's more likely a dermoid cyst. If it's a bump and it's down kind of on the neck, it's more likely a lymph node. I mean, these little things called lipomas can really be anywhere. Uh, again, we're happy to help, help you screen for these things, but um, if, if you have a family member or you have a child with a bump and it's where those lines are, you might be able to, to just calm everyone down for a little bit. It's very unlikely that this is some big bad brain tumor. Our big bad brain tumors simply don't pretend to present like this. Um, so this is one that's on the kind of nasion, kind of right in the front here. They can happen anywhere there are grooves in the bone. There actually is a groove between your nasal bone and your frontal bone. Um, we are doing more and more minimally invasive removals of these, similar to the cameras we use for synostosis. We can make a little incision by the hairline and slide a camera underneath the skin. The way you can tent up your own skin is the same way you can tent up skin all along the skull, the skull and slide a camera through. This is the, the view of the dermoid. This is the dermoid being pulled off, and this is the dermoid gone. Um, this is one of my patients who had a, a, a dermoid right, you can see it kind of right there, shadow, and then here's my KA initials. There. Um, and then hairline incision, and then I deliberately made a very blurry picture so that you can't see the incision many weeks later. Um, that, that's the view, but it's not going to be there. With the bump gone and never came back. Okay. Hydrocephalus. Uh, it, it varies depending on how old you are, how much CSF you produce. Hydrocephalus is the imbalance of, of what you make through the spinal fluid and what you absorb um, CSF. And uh, it's, it's uh, typically something that starts in the, the center of your brain in this tissue called choroid plexus. That's the pink, fluffy stuff that looks like coral. Um, and it works its way through the passageways out of the brain um, through these little holes called the foramina of Magendi and Lushka um, down in the back of your head. And they float out, and then they go to the top of your head. And where the purple is is your sagittal sinus. There are these bulbs that like protrude up out of the, the brain cavity and work their way back to that sinus. Those are called arachnoid granulations. That's the plumbing, that's the cycle. So you make the faucets on the inside, the choroid, and the strainer is the arachnoid granulations. Anywhere along that passageway, blockages can happen, or um, there can be things um, uh, messing with the flow, and then little by little, the sink overflows. Um, so it's important to mention that um, not all kids with extra fluid on their scans have hydrocephalus. Um, it's more accurate to say they have big ventricles or ventricular megaly. Um, and, and then we sh can help diagnose if they truly have hydrocephalus. So uh, occasionally we get these patients where the, the diagnosis is, uh, we're referring this patient to you for hydrocephalus management. And what they truly have is just a variation of their ventricles being a little bit larger so they have ventricular megaly. I just want to point out that distinction. Okay, what is the ideology of hydrocephalus? Um, so uh, the ones, the kids that we see tend to often have um, a blockage of, of flow from at different levels. One is where the, so the brain meets the skull, um, where the, so the brain is sagging down into the spinal cavity, and that's a Chiari malformation. Um, it's much more pronounced in patients who have neural tube defects or spina bifida or myelomeningocele. Um, when there's that going anywhere, um, so little by little the sink overflows. Um, that's the most common cause of congenital hydrocephalus. Um, you have little webs called um, the, at the, the a passageway called the aqueduct, that's aqueductal stenosis, um, cysts, and brain malformations called Dandy Walkers. Um, you can have infections, bleeding, for those of you in the NICU um, who have babies with intraventricular hemorrhage. All those little blood products, they scar and stain and clog up the arachnoid granulations. Or they don't physically, mechanically clog it, they irritate the granulations, and the granulations get swollen, and then they don't absorb as well. And so post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus is also very, very common tumors and stuff that we do. Um, 
I went through this. This is one of the, the, the key things that I wanted you guys to remember. Uh, um, if they have raised current pressure, they're going to you know, be irritable. They're going to be uh, having a full fontanelle. They're going to be vomiting. Um, sun setting eyes is another thing. If you look at them and they're kind of forced down, why? Because the tectum, the top of the brain stem, it's one of the more sensitive parts of your brain. It's one of the first things to kick in. If it's feeling pressure, it slowly pushes the gaze down. One of your, your gaze centers is in your tectum. When it gets pressure, it forces your gaze down. And so when you look at someone's eyes, it looks like the, the little sun on the horizon. It's called sun setting. Another name for it is called paranodes syndrome. Okay. Um, patient who has uh, congenital hydrocephalus, and this is a patient who's been treated. How do we get there? Um, we um, treat with these, these devices called shunts. I'm going to move past this. Sometimes we diagnose in utero. This is what a shunt looks like. This is, our, this is actually our model up in the office. Um, it shows you how I, we teach families how these things feel after they're in. Um, this is our prep. Don't come in our room. <laughs> um, uh, we, we pass the, uh, the shunt tubing underneath the skin um, through a hollow bore uh, tube. This is uh, Dr. Sun, very young, I should point out, Dr. Sun. Um, <laughs> passing a catheter <laughs> through. We try to lower our shunt infections by minimizing traffic, giving an antibiotics through the IV, obviously, washing everything, everything intrathecally with vancomycin and in our antibiotics um, with our irrigation. And then we prep, 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 prep. Very, very low um, uh, infection rate. Um, so you should know that shunts fail very frequently. Um, 30 to 40% of them fail in the first year. Um, and uh, at 20 years, most, most shunt kids or uh, patients have had four, at least four to six uh, revisions. Um, in fact, half of these things have failed within two years. Um, what is most likely the problem is proximal shunt malfunction. That fluffy stuff I showed you, that coral tissue, choroid, it's billowing every time the heart beats, and it billows, billows, billows into the catheter, and little by little picks off each one of these holes, um, and then takes away our heart shunt. Okay. This is our programmable valve. Um, this is a patient with slit ventricles. Uh, this just illustrates that when you have slit ventricles, it doesn't take much of, a, of an enlargement to start to feel sick. This kid came in symptomatic, and that's not a very big difference. And now, this is when this patient's almost herniated. So, not, not a terrible, terrible change, but um, it depends on the patient how your ventricles change. Um, I'm going to zip through a few more things. There's a couple of uh, big topics I want to um, show you. Um, this is us using an endoscope to treat hydrocephalus internally, where we can pass it all the way down and make a detour internally. Um, switching, switching, switching. I'm going to keep going. I apologize. This is the view uh, that you see internally. Um, this is the hole. Internal detour. That's an endoscopic third ventriculostomy. If every, anyone ever tells you, well, I heard it's a way to actually treat hydrocephalus without a shunt internally. This is it. ETV. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy. That hole is in the third ventricle. So a third ventriculostomy made with a camera, an endoscope, is an ETV. Endoscopic third ventriculostomy. I'm going to keep um, moving so we can get to a couple of topics before we, uh, we cl conclude. Um, okay, this is just showing that we here at Oakland have been using less and less CT scans and using more rapid MRIs. Okay, this is um, typical, you know, where there's this crossing percentiles, but this kid is starting to level off. This kid does not have hydra, they just had ventricular megaly. Um, this is benign extraaxial fluid at MTC. Um, where there's just extra fluid because the, skull, the brain is trying to catch up with the skull. So there's a little gap in between. Uh, following them over time, that gap goes away. Um, this kid, again, increased and then plateaued. Um, you're wanting to catch the kids um, who are increasing, increasing, or even take an even steeper increase because they can be the harbinger of something underneath. This is a kid who actually has a hydrocephalus secreting choroid plexus tumor called a choroid plexus papilloma. So you can see big ventricle and that's the tumor inside. Um, and this is the kid's head circumference who's been steadily increasing. You can see without being a neurosurgeon that this kid has macrocephaly. Um, and then that kid's head circumference took that jump. Okay, that's why it's important. Uh, tumors, tumors, tumors. Okay. Okay, this is a myeloma nigga seal, a neural tube defect. This is the cannoli cr cut and cross section that didn't seal. So now the, the neural plate fused with the ectoderm, the skin, and so now you have this opening. And what you're staring at, that big red thing in the center, is a splayed open spinal cord. And instead of fusing and seal sealing, it, it's splayed open and, and fused with the skin, and we have to surgically reconstruct those layers. Uh, what we more often see, though, are these things called tethered cords. 
the cannoli can, can fuse abnormally in a very subtle way where a little trap is left behind um, and, it, and it's, it causes the spinal cord to be anchored to the end of the spinal canal. Um, we typically say that anything stretched down below L2, so L3, L4, L5, um, on, the spinal, on the spinal MRI or ultrasound, that's probably as to the spinal cord, but we have to kind of work through that with you guys. Um, work through. So anything, again, lower than L2, 3 interspace, that's what we consider abnormal. Um, there can be things hiding underneath. This is um, one of those dimples that led to a trap, that led to an opening, that led to a big tuft of fat fused to the spinal cord. Um, and this is post-op. This is what a tethered spinal cord looks like, um, a uh, fatty phylum, if you've ever heard of that term. Um, in my instrument on the left, I'm holding the fat, um, fatty phylum and, and separating it from the nerves. Yeah, that's the cut. Um, what do we look for on the outside? Cutaneous manifestations, dimples above the crease, little patches of blood vessels, lipomas, tufts of hair, um, a crooked crease, um, even little things growing out of the baby butt crack. Um, and I'll show you some, some quick pictures of those. This is a hemangioma, dimple, dimple, dimple and hemangioma. Um, that is a dermal sinus tract leading down to a low spinal cord. Um, this is a cartoon illustration of what it looks like. Um, this is a normal baby butt crack, okay? <laughs> this is a dimple inside the baby butt crack. So um, this is what we call a sacral pit. Um, these are normal. These don't uh, amount to anything. Occasionally, you'll see a little fiber that goes to the tailbone. Who cares? We care more about going to the spinal uh, canal. Okay. Um, we have about five minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zip through these. I just want to show you some illustrative tumor cases. Um, there's quite a lot of slides, so I do apologize. Um, I'm sorry. Tuft of hair. Crooked baby butt crack. Um, very subtle crooked baby butt crack. The funny, I'll tell you a funny story as I'm going through these. Um, my we take a lot of these pictures with, my, with our phones. Um, and sometimes my phone is linked to my screensavers at home. Uh, and so uh, you know, have dinner gets over and you know, we're drinking wine and the screensavers in the back. And you know, kids, kids, daughter, son, baby butt crack. Brain <laughs> tumor. Kids, kids, kids. Um, okay, so just to spend the last five minutes um, uh, talking about brain tumors. Um, they almost never present just with headaches. You know, the whole thing, people come to us like, oh my god, my kid has a headache, they must have a brain tumor. Um, they almost never present just with headaches alone. Um, when we get scans, it's going to be midline. Pediatric brain tumors tend to be midline. Um, it really depends on where they are and what kind of tumor uh, type it is. And many are curable in kids. Um, it, it really depends, though, on the extent of resection. I'm just going to show you some just illustrative pictures of what these things can look like. They can be much, much bigger in kids because the skull is much more accommodating um, and they don't get as sick. Whereas if we have something expanding in our skull, which is sealed, that intracranial pressure rises rapidly. Kids can dissipate that pressure with the fontanelle, with the soft spot, with the, with the bones actually opening. Um, so they can get quite, quite large. Um, they can be in the spinal cord. I want to just quickly show you um, a, a, an illustrative slide about um, uh, histology. Most of them are gliomas, and you may have seen or read or heard of some of these names um, in, in, in your walks of life. Um, and then location matters as well. Um, most of them um, are in the cerebellar hemisphere. So basically, the cerebellum is back here. Most of our kid tumors are back here. Um, very rarely do they um, form right where the optic nerves cross, called the chiasm. And so that's one end of the spectrum is the chiasm, well, unlikely, and cerebellum, most likely, and then you have a spectrum in between. Um, these are just illustrative pictures of MRIs and an intra-op um, of tumors, post-op. Spinal cord tumors. This is the chiasm where the optic nerves cross going to the eyeballs. Post-op. Posterior fossa, hemisphere, this is what they look like on this one. Um, just wanted to show you an illustrative sign. So the, the, these lines that go down are called um, Kaplan-Meier curves and survival curves. Um, and so you want your lines to be high, um, survival high. And so you see the ones that are survival high are no residual tumor. The better we can do by getting more tumor out, the more, they're gonna, the more likely they are going to survive. Versus if you, 
if you rarely get everything out, it's a subtotal resection, or if you get your resection but they're actually metastases going somewhere else, you haven't gotten everything, you can see how the, the survival curves uh, fall off. Um, so one minute left, I'm just going to show you some just um, tumor pictures. When we open, this is often what we see. There's no tumor there. You actually have to work a little bit to move things aside and it's down deep. That's the, that's the cerebellum. Okay. And then I, I couldn't end any, any um, talk being the uh, director of the pediatric epilepsy program with at least showing an electrode. Okay. Done my job. Epilepsy. Um, when you have epilepsy, you don't always have a tumor or something underneath there that's the source of it. It's, um, it's MRI invisible. So you have to go hunting and fishing for it. And so this is our fishing net. We cast the net by putting these electrodes over the surface of the brain, which for all the world looks normal by gross inspection, looks normal by MRI, looks normal by all these other modalities. But when you get an EEG, it says seizure, 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 seizure. So which of these gyri is responsible? When I cast my net, I sometimes do it in one sitting where I always sit and we just wait for that net to get a bite and then we see, ah, it's on electrodes 28, 28, 12. Um, or we leave them in place, close up, we, and we're doing that routinely here at Open Children's, um, and then come back later on in the week and let those fishing bites happen. Um, and then little by little we generate a map of where the abnormal tissue is and we take that out. You can do that. It's okay to take brain tissue out. In fact, that brain tissue, its only role in life is to seize. Very rarely, do you have good and bad like this, where you're taking out good tissue as you're taking out the bad? Um, often, you have good and bad right next to each other, and so we're not doing this barbaric cutting out of tissue anymore. We're using these devices called neurostimulators, um, where we find out that good and bad is like this, and so we can't take it out, but we can leave behind electrodes. And when a seizure starts, the electrode gives a little zap, and it's kind of like, stop that, don't seize, and this, it interrupts the seizure. So there are these implantable devices now that we can use to interrupt the seizures. Um, so that's, that's all I'll say about epilepsy. I wish we had all day just to talk about pediatric neurosurgery, but you have a long line of things to talk about. Um, and I just wanted to, to give you just a sampling of things. Um, and I did want to start and, 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 and finish by saying um, those are the, those important things I want you to remember. Please don't forget those. Um, but more, more than anything else, thank you so much uh, for all that you do for our patients uh, neurosurgery patient. It's a, it's a joy to work with you guys. Um, I want to teach you in any opportunity I can. I was so excited to have this opportunity. Always stop me and never worry about, can I ask you a question? That's what I'm here for. Uh, I really love working with you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you.